Celebrating 46 years on the air, Award-Winning Farm Week is a production of Mississippi State University Extension. Today on Farm Week, Ukraine gets help from Romania to help move its grain onto the world markets. In Southern Gardening, how to make a mailbox garden a thing of true beauty. Plus, in the markets, we look at this month's WASDE report, row crops and livestock. And in our Farm Week feature, using drones to control insect populations, you won't believe how they do it. Farm Week starts right now. Hello everyone, I'm Jonah Holland. And I'm Zach Ashmore. Great to have you with us again here on Farm Week. Mike Russell is out on assignment. Since the beginning of the Ukraine war, one of the biggest questions, at least from an ag perspective, was how will they export their grain? After all, Ukraine is one of the largest producers in the world. A safe passage grain corridor negotiated between Ukraine and Russia was passed last year and recently Russia has ended the agreement, which leads us back to the question of grain exports. Well, a neighboring country, Romania, has stepped in to provide support. Romania is looking to help Ukraine double the monthly shipping capacity of its grain to the Black Sea port of Constanta. According to Reuters, this could help the war-torn country's exports by up to 4 million tons, particularly through the Danube River. Ukraine is one of the world's top grain exporters, and Russia has been attacking its agricultural and port infrastructure after refusing to extend a year-old safe passage grain corridor brokered by the United Nations and Turkey. The attacks included Ukraine's inland Danube ports of Rini and Ismail. Before the safe passage agreement ended, the Danube River ports accounted for about a quarter of Ukraine's grain exports. Romanian Transport Minister Soren Grindenu says the country will hire more staff to ease vessel passage into the Danube and finalize connecting infrastructure projects, many of them EU-funded, to help Ukraine get more grain out of the country. After meeting with representatives from the EU, the US, Moldova, and Ukraine, he further stated, quote, I have underlined the importance of Romanian rail, road, and naval transport routes to maintain a constant flow for Ukrainian exports. It was a good meeting, which will lead us through the agreed measures to raise grain transit capacity from over 2 million tons per month at present to almost 4 million tons in the coming months." Unquote. Grindenu assures that Romania's Danube Administration Agency will have 60 pilots taking ships in and out of the Salina Canal by the end of August. An EU-funded project to allow sailing at night will be completed in October. Ukrainian Deputy Prime Minister Oleksandr Kubrikov says the Danube was, quote, one of the key and attractive logistics routes for export of Ukrainian agricultural products. Ukraine also is interested in the possibility to organize additional places for roadside transshipment of vessels in the territorial waters in Romania, in particular near the port of Constanta and near Salina Channel. It's no secret we've seen a rise in inflation these past few years. If you spend any time in the grocery store, you no doubt have seen it. However, some good news, U.S. food inflation rate is falling. It's been on the downtrend for a while now, but things are beginning to look like they were before inflation took off. The U.S. food inflation rate has fallen to 4.9%, the lowest in nearly two years. The rate has been declining since the fall of 2022. Economy-wide prices have increased 3.2% in the 12 months ending in July, said the Monthly Consumer Price Index report from the Bureau of Labor Statistics. According to their report, the largest decline in pork products included bacon, pork chops, ribs, and breakfast sausage. In dairy, egg and milk prices have lowered, but vegetables and margarine prices went up. Meat, poultry, fish, and eggs index declined less than half a percent over the year. According to Successful Farming, food is the second largest expense for Americans, taking about 13 cents of each dollar in consumer spending. Housing is number one, taking about 34 cents per dollar. Mark Zandi, chief economist at Moody's Analytics, says to be sure the high inflation of the past two plus years has done lots of economic damage. He further added, due to the high inflation, the typical household spent $202 more in July than they did a year ago to buy the same goods and services. And they spent $709 more than they did two years ago. 
but the trend lines look good and suggests inflation is set to moderate further. The USDA estimates that food prices will be an average of about 6% higher this year and will rise by about 2.5% in 2024. This is in line with the long-term average of a 2.8% increase annually. On the lighter side, Mailbox Gardens, a way to express your gardening prowess in a small space. Eddie Smith looks at the garden of former Southern gardening producer Tim Allison to showcase some beautiful examples of what you can use in your own project. Here's Eddie. Southern Gardening has been sharing Tim's mailbox garden since it was built in 2011. Over the years, it has transformed into the beautiful garden you see here today. This planting features multiple layers of interest. The black-eyed Susans, with their bright yellow flowers and black centers, are really showing out. The perennial bravado purple coneflowers have become a mainstay in the garden with their two to four inch blooms of bright purple petals and dark green center cones. This year, red and orange colored coneflowers were added along with white pentas that stand out against the dark green foliage. A variety of Rebecca with four inch wide flowers with warm festive shades of gold, orange, and mahogany is another addition to the garden this year. I love the lower growing plants sprawling all around the landscape bed. Purple Heart has been a solid performer this year. I really like the dark purple color. Ornamental peppers add color and interest to the garden and look great tucked in behind the Purple Heart. Purslane is a tough summer plant that thrives in our Mississippi heat and reseeds there every year. It forms a dense mat and is covered with flowers. Around the mailbox post are some Stokes asters with their unique purple colored flowers. The clump of hardy banana plants anchor the end of the bed and the dark red flowers of the hardy hibiscus certainly add interest to the mailbox planting. Try using some of these plants to create a beautiful mailbox planting of your own. I'm Eddie Smith and I will see you next time on Southern Gardening. We'll take a break right here, but don't go away. Coming up on our Farm Week feature, it's a newish technology building on an old one using drones to fight pests in the fields by delivering sterile insects to mate with them. It's a new spin on something called SIT. We'll meet the owners of a company who helped pioneer this biocontrol technique, who even designed their own drones just to make it work. That's coming up on Farm Week. Don't go away. I believe in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believe in my own work and in the opportunity I have to make my life useful to humanity. I believe that education is a lifelong process and the greatest university is the home. That my success as a teacher is proportional to those qualities of mind and spirit that give me welcome entrance to the homes of the families that I serve. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. in people and their hopes, their aspirations and their faith. I believed that education, of which extension work is an essential part, is basic in stimulating individual initiative, self-determination and leadership. I believe that these are the keys to democracy and that people, when given facts they understand, will act not only in their self-interest but also in the interest of society. I believe in intellectual freedom. 
to search for and present the truth without bias and with courteous tolerance towards the views of others. Because I believe these things, I am an extension professional. Time for the market report. Not much movement last week, which is pretty interesting, but the reasons for it might even be more so. And we'll get into it, but first, the numbers. Slight gains and losses, we'll see how things closed last week. And then this month's WASDE report dropped, we'll see what it had to say. And finally, we give you our row report and a livestock report to see what's truly moving the needle. So, markets closed last week without any big changes. Seems we're in a pre-harvest lull. Let's take a look. Last week's biggest gain, cotton up about three and a half cents, a near four and a quarter percent increase. The reasons have to do with poor crop situation worldwide, and we'll get more into that soon. Last week's biggest loss, soybeans down 27 cents, about a 2% drop. Reasons for that have to do with geopolitics. But before we get into the details, let's look at this month's WASD report. No real big changes, at least none that we didn't see coming. The biggest takeaways have to do with lower row crop production and lower livestock inventory affecting potential stocks. Here's what it said. U.S. wheat supplies down as production also down 5 million bushels. All wheat yield down 0.3 million bushels from last month. Domestic use down 3 million bushels. Exports down 25 million bushels. Season average farm price unchanged at $7.50 per bushel. Global wheat supplies down 4.3 million tons due to lower production in China, EU, and Canada despite higher production in Ukraine and Kazakhstan. Consumption down 3.4 million tons. Trade also down 2.2 million tons. Ending stocks down 0.9 million tons. U.S. corn beginning stocks 55 million bushels higher than last month. Use lower due to less corn used for glucose, dextrose, and starch. Production down 209 million bushels. Season average farm price $4.90 per bushel. Global corn production down due to cuts in the EU, China, and Russia, partially offset by increases in Ukraine and Canada. Ending stocks down 1.6 million tons. U.S. rice production up 2.6 million hundredweight. Average all rice yield up 100 pounds. Ending stocks raised 1.6 million hundredweight. Season average farm price $17.70 per hundredweight. Global rice supplies raised 0.4 million tons. Production is also up. Exports down 3.4 million tons. World use down 1 million tons. Ending stocks up 1.3 million tons. U.S. soybean beginning stocks up due to higher imports. Production forecast 4.2 billion bushels down. Harvested area unchanged. Yield per acre 1.1 bushels from last month. Season average farm price, $12.70 per bushel. Global soybean production unchanged. Exports down 0.5 million tons. Crush and exports reduced for Bangladesh, Egypt, and Pakistan. Ending stocks down 1.6 million tons. U.S. red meat and poultry production down from last month due to lower cattle herds and less egg hatchability. Cattle price forecasts up due to lower herds but continued packer demand. U.S. milk production forecasts lower from last month due to lower cow inventory. Forecasts for butter, cheese, and nonfat dry milk prices raised while whey prices lowered. 2023 all milk price forecast raised to $19.35 per hundred weight. U.S. cotton beginning stocks up 450,000 bales due to slightly lower exports. Production down 2.5 million bales, which means exports projected down 1.3 million bales. Ending stocks also 700,000 bales down. Season average farm price 79 cents per pound. Global cotton production forecast 2.7 million bales down this month and consumption 500,000 bales higher. Ending stocks down 2.9 million bales. Projected exports and consumption also up. This week in our row report, we focus on four major row crops, wheat, corn, soybeans, and cotton. Like we saw in the WASDE report, weather and global issues affecting the price more than anything else, which is actually pretty normal. According to market analyst Sean Hackett, though, these issues haven't moved the needle too much, but soon they could be the driving factor. The geopolitical instability is starting to escalate, and I believe we're moving towards a point where we're going to see that override that bearish Russian factor, and everyone has given up that it's ever gonna happen again because they're exhausted from it. I really feel we're moving away from U.S. weather to an escalation of geopolitics for wheat, which drives the whole grain sector into the fall. Right now, under $5, we're not excited about selling the market here. We do think weather's kind of off the table. We're having some good cooler wetter weather into mid-August. We're getting some good grain fuel. I just don't see the reason why weather's gonna drive the core market higher. Having said that, having said that, China flooding is a problem. 
They've had a big, big typhoon. The, China, the corn price futures in China have spiked considerably in the last week, and they're getting ready for harvest. I think there's something going on with the China flood of corn crop that they may come up short. Geopolitics affects soybeans the least because we're not dealing with selling soybeans out of Ukraine or selling soybeans out of Russia. But the flooding in China, even though they don't grow as much soybeans as they do corn, is a factor. The other thing is we're looking at post-ASF pork shortage later in the year. Dry weight prices taking off, bean meal prices in China taking off, the hog price in China taking off. It's suggesting the herd liquidation is over. What do they need to feed piglets? Dry whey and meal. Sounds to me like they might need to come in for more soybeans sooner rather than later. Exports are missing the USDA mark by about 500,000 bales, but Texas weather horrible. Gujarat in India, weather terrible. The weather in China, terrible. In our estimation, the losses in production in those three key countries for cotton production are so severe, it's going to override the loss of demand that has been keeping the market bearish. We think prices are going to work higher. We're very constructive of the market right now based on supply, not based upon demand. In livestock news, the biggest news is ongoing lower herds. Like the WASDE said, it's causing shortages, which could very well cause prices to go up. This is an issue affecting three big industries, the first being milk. Obviously, with less cows, there's less milk, which has shot up the price. Once again, analyst Sean Hackett gives us the details. We got down to $13.5 hundred weight in July, the worst margins in the history of the U.S. dairy industry, and, then, and now we're sitting here at $17, $18 hundred weight, massive, massive reversal higher. We got a cow coal rate in dairy in the U.S., the lowest since 1986. And so we're looking at a synchronous decline in the dairy herd globally that's going to start to show a significant contraction in production later this year, just as the Chinese are going to be looking for cheap pork, cheap chicken, and milk powder, which is another big protein source for them. So I really think this reversal off the July low is an important mark low mark to, that's going to trigger a much more prosperous period ahead for dairy. Well, live cow, the way I see it is because all these dairy cows are being culled, we're getting this extra supply coming into the low end of the market. Australia dealing with El Nino related drought, their cattle prices have been crashing. They're going to be selling a lot more beef to us. The cold storage beef supplies in Asia, they're at record levels to the brim, meaning they're probably going to have to push back on importing beef for a little while to work those levels down. Everything says we might be entering a period of indigestion here to kind of work this high price off that's been with us for quite some time. There's herd liquidation in the market because the margins have been so bad, like dairy. Um, having said that, what does herd liquidation mean? If you're not replacing them, it means we're going to have much lower supplies later in the year, just as China's going to be looking for significant supply to bring in to their country to handle the pork shortage. So, um, you know, short term, the next 30 days could be a little ugly as we deal with this herd liquidation post panic buying from the Supreme Court decision. After that, I'm very constructive hogs from the fourth quarter onward. I think we could see some much, much better margins in 24. And that's it for a deeper look into the markets. Weather and supplies, a common subject these days, and with harvest coming up, no sign it'll be going away. Jonah? Thanks, Zach. Needless to say, insects can drive a farmer to frustration as an otherwise healthy crop is decimated by an army of tiny invaders. Now, a new spin on old technology may have the backs of producers. Colleen Bradford Krantz has the story. Fence requires position. Ignition sequence start. Six, five, Four, three, two, one, zero. All engine running. Liftoff. We have a liftoff. This launch isn't shooting for the moon or a distant planet. No rocket boosters are needed. And the passengers inside? Insects. We develop, in collaboration with USDA, a uh, drone-based system for releasing sterile insects. On a September day in western Michigan, the insects traveling during this routine drone launch by M3 Agriculture Technologies are codling moths. 6,400 moths. The bane of existence for many pear and apple orchard owners. Codling moth is really the worm in the apple. 
It, you know, it's the primary pest. It's, the, it's always been a, a nuisance for growers for the last 200 years in North America. It's the predominant pest worldwide. I think the only place where coddling moth is not an issue or has not established is in Japan and some parts of Asia. Coddling moths have long been a foe at Hayden Farms of Pasco, Washington. But when the apple and cherry producers switched a half dozen years ago to organic apple practices, meaning synthetic pesticides were no longer an option, they struggled to keep control. The major pest in apples by far is coddling moth. And so when we first converted, we were clean coming from conventional to organic. We didn't have any coddling moth problems. Then we had a neighbor that was organic and kind of got in trouble with the farm and his control went to heck. A lot of problems, and those problems drifted over to us. We tried every means possible to control coddling moths. Hayden says they ultimately needed an answer beyond just natural oils and an insect virus spray. Those worked, but oils can only be applied a few times before harming the trees, and the viral spray needed to be reapplied repeatedly, driving their pesticide spending up. The viral spray also had to be consumed by the insects, meaning they would leave tiny bite holes in the fruit, known as stings. Inspired by Washington State University's research into sterilized insects as biocontrols in orchards, Hayden decided to give it a try, hiring M3. We were really shocked the first year we saw real good results. We still had some stings that first year with it. Since then, we have really been very clean this year. I mean, I might have seen a couple stings all season in 125 acres. Although drone delivery of insects is relatively new, sterile insect technique, or SIT, is not. SIT is a type of biological control, an alternative or supplement to chemicals when managing agricultural pests like coddling moth. The insects that we release are sterilized. They're sterilized with ionizing radiation. Uh, and it, it damages their DNA to the point to where they're still viable uh, as far as they're able to fly and they're able to act as insects. But when they mate with another insect, with a native insect that's out in the, the target environment, uh, they will lay an infertile egg. USDA has been using sterile insect strategies for decades, most notably when airplanes dropped sterilized pink bollworms, an insect that once devastated cotton crops all over the South. In 2018, USDA announced it had successfully eradicated pink bollworm. That the pink bollworm is officially eradicated. Present in the U.S. ecosystem for more than a century. Sterile insect technology is not a standalone technology in most cases. In the pink bollworm, we, we had a variety of technologies that we used. We hit pink bollworm with everything we had. You have to have a thorough knowledge of the insect's biology, its field behavior, and how it interacts with the host and all of its natural enemies. After being awarded a grant, M3 began working with USDA in 2014 on developing a rapid response system in case of any small breakouts of pink bollworm. Four years later, the Dayton, Ohio-based company got to work figuring out how to safely ship and store sterilized Mexican fruit flies, lady beetles, coddling moths, and other insects from insect rearing facilities before attempting to drop sometimes reluctant bugs from drones into treetops. The company designed its own drones and release devices. When we went up to Washington and started releasing sterile coddling moth, then we retreated 50 acres. In 2019, we treated 1,200 acres, and that was our first year of commercial sales. Now we are at 4,000 acres in, in 2022 and growing quite nicely. The company, now with 10 employees, has moved away from its previous dependence on government grants. Besides contracts in Washington, M3 now has customers in California, Idaho, and Michigan. Part of the reason for the growing enthusiasm among producers is that insects, just like weeds, develop resistance to pesticides. For the majority of crops, especially apples and pears, there's no new chemical formulations coming online. There's, there's no more being developed. Uh, it, it takes generally 10 years of a, a, a long pipeline, millions of dollars to develop you know, different chemical formulations. We think that methods such as uh, biocontrol using, using insects and such, those are going to become uh, more and more popular. 
I think there are a lot of options with SIT and it, it, I think it depends a lot on the pest you're talking about and the crop and just the, the setting for exactly where and what you have to work with. Altitude is 30. Various studies estimate the value of natural biological control of native pests in U.S. crops at between $1.7 billion and $5.5 billion. A Canadian facility is the only large-scale insectary rearing sterilized codling moths. Crumpets expects demand to grow for other insects, especially predatory mites that feed on two-spotted spider mites, which are harmful to crops like hops and strawberries. Also, green lacewing, which eat other harmful aphids, show promise for many specialty crops, including fruits, nuts, and marijuana. The big issue that we face is the supply of insects long term. Such an interesting solution, using modern technology in a truly innovative way. I must admit, I was really impressed with how they came up with that. Me too. Well, next time on Farm Week, a special episode on row crops. Ever wonder what makes our major row crops so special? We take a deep dive into soybeans, corn, and wheat to see what makes them tick, how they're grown, what challenges farmers face, and the factors on their price. If you're not careful, you might learn something you'll never forget. Getting into the dirt with these major row crops. That's next time on Farm Week. Remember, if you missed a story, look for past episodes of Farm Week on our website at farmweek.tv. And don't forget to follow us on Facebook, Twitter, and YouTube as well. We'll see you next week. Thanks for watching.